Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Brightworks and another match of Beyond All Reason. I won't lie to you, you better get a drink and you better get a snack because today's episode is going to be an extremely long one. As far as long games go, it's definitely up there. Probably not the longest game we've ever covered on this channel, but definitely well up there in time. Today, spawning on the right-hand side, representing the blue team as a Cortex commander, goes by the name of Scarecrow100. Going to be clocking in at 29 true skill and a couple of silver... Tails on those chevrons here for the right-hand side, the blue team today, all the way on the other side. Spawning on the northern side as an armada commander goes by the name of Laudy. Now, Laudy definitely sounds like maybe Scottish or Irish or something like that. Come here, Laudy. Something like that, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure those two individual audiences will be cringing in their seats as they hear me say that. But other than that, I'm excited to see what our armada commander has in store for us. So... I'm sure you can already tell by checking the replay, or not the replay folder, but the, uh, the, the timer on this video that it's going to be a bit of a long one. And I think I can understand why. It's because of this map. In Trench Plains version 2, this is a remake of 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 a remake. Uh, it goes all the way back in ancient history. There's, there's tons of maps that were designed like this, and for good reason. It's a pretty interesting layout. It means you essentially have a big old battle on the northern side, a big old battle on the southern side, and this... Just back and forth brawl in the middle of the map here. This pretty much is the most technical lane in the map. Usually we see the most uh, experienced players taking this lane because it is so technically inclined. In this case, however, Poopy Tartoni going to be taking the wheel right here. Going to be going up against McDuddle. McDuddle definitely a little bit more experience if the true skill and chevron counts are anything to go off of here. Now, one of the things that makes this map so challenging is there's this distinct line right here. You can see where the mountains change angles. You can see this mountain is angled upwards like this, making it very defensive. And this angle is up like that, makes it very defensive. It means that typically if either team manages to set up a defensive line on those mountains, it can be very expensive to break. And one of the reasons why we often see these games go quite late. So I'll be interested to see if that's what we end up doing here or if maybe we go the distance because everybody gets punched lights out in the face and has to rebuild from scratch those are always some of the best we'll just have to wait and see max mustard here doing a little uh a little one two step here trying to uh do something <laughs> yeah commander a little a little stuck on his buildings as it were interesting sometimes those commanders man they have the funniest pathing preoccupied with the ticks that are already in the back line this is an excellent start right here for the yellow commander Every time I see Tex in the back line doing some damage, it gives me a lot of confidence in the player here. So definitely Max Mustard showing me that he knows what he should be up to as far as Armada Commanders go in the early game. Blowing up his friend, or his, his friend, his opposite of his friend's wind turbines right here. Taking out a metal extractor as well. Definitely well worth it for the cost of three ticks. Scimitar definitely going to be rebuilding here for a good long while. At the very least, the Resbots reclaiming a whole bunch of the trees and other flora and fauna around the world that can be converted into energy matter. Definitely uh, keeping the Powder Blue Commander afloat right here, but will not forever. So you have to be on top of getting that energy production up and running. Poopy Tartoni going for an expensive composition here. We've got a bot lab fabricating a couple of maces here. No build power or anything like that associated with this lab here, though. So very, very slow unit production. Poopy Tartoni going to be in a little bit of a tricky situation. I'm a little addicted to saying Poopy Tartoni. I don't know why. Just, uh, just a beautiful name. If it, ever, uh, if it ever rolls off your tongue as well, I'm sure you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Give it a try here. Yeah, just... In the dark of night, give it a give it a little try. Poopy Tartoni. Yeah. McDuddle over here. Gonna be lining up with a more voluminous army. Less quality though. Doesn't matter though. Those pawns jump on top of that mace, and it will only take an instant before it's blasted to pieces right here. The reaction speed of a tortoise. A tortoise that was bred with a turtle. Poopy Tartoni D-guns the air. About a minute after, McDuddle has gone ahead and uh, sent the units forward to kill this. A mace now firing away at the commander over here. I mean, fair enough. We're going to put a little bit of damage on that commander. Oh, and some Rocketeers coming out here as well. Looks like the Commander 1984 are going to be trying to contribute here as well. Putting some of those rocket bots on the front line. Going to be quite a bit more effective, I do believe, than those maces. Especially without any sort of res bot support. Oh. <laughs> so let me let me paint a picture of what happened right here. Uh, transport was flying this commander forward when suddenly 
Two or three blue planes flew forward and caught the commander midair and managed to shoot it out of the sky, bringing it down, crumbling out of the sky, or plummeting out of the skies, and leaving a nice juicy wreckage full of metal right here for the Red Commander. Probably changing the plans right now for the Red Commander, who was probably expecting to be uh, using that commander on the front lines, now is going to have a whole lot of metal to spare, building up an economy or some units or basically anything in the back line here. Yeah, we go for our metal storage, just to make sure we don't waste any of that juicy, juicy commander metal. Paid for it quite literally with our quali our most quality unit's life, so you might as well make good use of it. And yeah, Shuriken's out in the air right here for the orange commander and the red team in general. Going to be quite good, yeah, especially against a lot of this T1 chaff, though Shuriken really can make these fights so much more efficient. Hard to describe really how much more efficient it is. It's asymptotically approaching infinity as the uh, Shurikens begin to paralyze everything. But there we go, only a single blast from their little beam there manages to completely paralyze any units on the front and there we go rocketeer is gonna blast that pawn to smithereens Grigulio setting up some light anti-air so at the very least those shurikens can't come any closer to the army and down they will start to fall you do have to be very careful those shurikens they tend to stack up quite brutally and once they stack up just a little too much suddenly you find yourself in a really unfortunate situation where all of them get knocked out by a single light anti-air missile Definitely very tricky. Aggression on the front side, or on the uh, northern side, the front lines of the northern side, the cumulative sentence that I was trying to reach right there. Hot paint tanks will keep falling right here as the grunts continue to swarm forward. And Sizer's not really going to be able to hold up to the twin barreled las cannons mounted atop each arm of these green grunts moving across the field here. Styles Rosa going to be trying to patch the lines right here. We need tons and tons of LLTs to stop this sort of a play from happening. Yeah, but the shurikens are a nice little way to clean that up as well. And eventually the medium tanks will deal with it. What did we lose in the end right there? A couple of tanks, a couple of metal extractors. Uh, actually, yeah, okay, a couple of metal extractors. Just a few. Not the end of the world by hardly any measure right here for the red team. But I love to see the aggression coming out from Bar and Neck Barzy. I feel like we've seen this commander in a whole lot of games recently. Anywho, McDuddle is looking fabulous with this Geothermal coming up and running right now. If this Geothermal can manage to come up and running here for the Purple Commander, it does mean, of course, that that energy economy will be magnified by 300 extra energy per second. Very, very good, especially for when you're getting ready to transition into that T2. Pretty much enough to transition into T2 all and it's lonesome, so seeing a t2 transition from the purple commander wouldn't be too surprising especially considering how many units we already have on the front line this is a solid number of units you could definitely stall for quite a good long while with this many units especially two res bots would keep all this alive for an extremely long amount of time you just trade these out as slowly as you can and eventually you're going to end up with a nice little t2 transition wouldn't even mind seeing it started up right now from the purple commander doesn't look like mcduddle here agrees though going to be going into a little bit more economy rather not the end of the world, obviously. More economy means more units, and more units means more production here. A little LLT built on the the high ground right here from the Scimitar. Going to mean that, uh, yeah, at the very least, that metal extractor goes down right here. Sloth Demon loses the metal extractor. It might not seem like a lot, but denying these metal extractors is really important. I do love to see it. Commander could definitely help with that, maybe a little better. Oh, okay, we have LLTs right here. <laughs> is this on a repeat command? It is on a repeat command, that's funny. We're just constantly starting up and then losing this laser tower. Oh no, that's so much metal down the drain. This thing's pumping three metal per second, more or less, into this tower. But we're unable to keep it standing because of all the LLTs up here. That is pretty funny. There we go. One of the LLTs will fall, and I think that might throw the balance of this. This is a, this is a weird, <laughs> a weird interaction. I don't think we've ever seen one of these before. Continually setting up the static defense and then continually being blasted down again. It's uh, it's an immovable object, the LLT, versus the unstoppable force, the builder on repeat queue. This is uh, this is pretty weird. I'm I'm so curious who's gonna win this one in the end. I have a feeling it's gonna go towards the static defenses though, because each one of these that they kill, they get a little bit of experience, which is obviously well worth it. McDuddle, sands of a T2 transition, has instead decided to invest in more and more Rocketeers. Not the end of the world. However, the gauntlet is just about to be completed right here for Poopy Tartoni, who is well aware of just how dangerous these things can be up on the front lines. It's well guarded by LLTs as well, which does prevent the probably most obvious counter, which is just to send a whole bunch of pawns forward and try and overwhelm the gauntlet here. Excellent positioning as far as that is concerned. And that gauntlet is going to start firing away. Yeah, there we go. Relative to T1 units, it does certainly do... Oh, wow, that's a lot of build power. And on the front lines, too. Relative to T1 units, it certainly does a lot of damage. There is a jammer turret up right here, though, from McDuddle, who is definitely well aware of exactly that that gauntlet was coming up and decided to counteract it by just hiding himself. 
Definitely a viable strategy. Barnek Barzi trying to move forward here too, but those riot tanks are so punishing. Yeah, as soon as your tanks get within range of those riot tanks, they stop. They stop moving completely, and it's very annoying. Riot tanks actually with an interesting synergy I hadn't thought of before, but the shell shocker is obviously quite powerful against static targets, things that aren't moving. The riot tanks capable of maybe not necessarily inflicting so much damage, but being able to shut down these units or at the very least stop them from moving. Yeah, there's a kind of interesting synergy there where the shell shockers can suddenly make the, uh, or pardon me, the riot tanks, the pounders can suddenly make the wolverines so much more effective. Huh. Interesting little interaction between those two. I had never even thought of before. Ah, man, the AoE on that gauntlet. It is rare that I crown the gauntlet an efficient enough unit to be put down on the front line with 1,250 metal worth of cost. Very, very difficult to find an efficient way to use one of those, but here we go. Taking down already quite a few of these forward uh, rocket bots up here. We are going to repair command, by the way. Honestly, I feel like we should just reclaim these damaged ones, right? It might be more cost efficient to just reclaim those and use them to go for that T2 transition again. Yeah, I'm not really sure if the advanced solar panel is the right move here. I mean, we do have the, well, we had the geothermal until it was barraged by all of these uh, wolverines over here. That's actually quite nice. Quite a cool little play right there. Big old fighter clash over here as well. I think we were trying to uh, accompany this little breakthrough of medium tanks. Well, maybe not a little medium tank breakthrough, actually. We do have in grand total for the green commander, eight, eight medium tanks as of right now, eventually shut down by the shurikens and the fighter support, not able to break through the orange air wall. Beautifully done right there by the orange commander. I'm sure his team is going to be grateful to have that many fighters up in the skies protecting all their valuable assets from paralyzation and the like. Heavy laser turret up here will eventually win out. I guess the uh, the winner will be the constructors after all. Ironic to cut to that right as it gets obliterated. Beamer turret trying its very best as well. The laser pointer. Quite a hilarious unit. One of my favorites actually. As far as static defense goes, I like it so much because it's so reliable. It does such a consistent amount of DPS. And it uh, pretty much doesn't miss, which is, you know, as far as reliability goes, it's pretty much the ideal unit. Commander Death over here, blasted down by a whole bunch of missile trucks and the like, will eventually be gobbled up by the commander's uh, army here, I guess. Auto cannibalism, not a concern right here for Barnek Barzi. As far as I'm concerned, though, the most important thing is going to be getting those T2 transitions underway. Are we ready for T2 from either team? Yes, we are indeed. So we have a T2 lab up and running right here for the Red Commander. We should have T2. I thought I saw a T2 lab. Yeah, there it is. We have a T2 lab in the back line right here for Tolero. And I saw a forward T2 as well. Yeah, so the Green Commander also going to be going for a forward T2, eating up that vehicle bay in order to pay for it. How about T2 on the bottom lane here? Uh, not quite. We have a T2 constructor. And we're going for a fusion reactor into a T2 lab right here. Not a bad idea, especially if you can afford to buy one of those constructors from your teammate as opposed to just uh, making the whole lab yourself. Way more efficient to build a T2 economy before you get the lab, which, you know, on paper doesn't really make any sense. But if you played VAR, you know exactly what I mean. It's the power of friendship. This is, uh, hold on, this, this reminds me of something. I'll flash it on the screen right here. Anyway. <laughs> That's, uh, that, that, that put me in a sour mood. I don't know why. It just suddenly, that, like, that, like ruined my day. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think Sisyphus is a hopeful story, or do you think Sisyphus is a, uh, a tale of misery? Aren't there, two, aren't there two popular interpretations of Sisyphus, and one is, like, the, the reward is the action of doing it, and, and then the other is, like, this is, what, this, is, this is what they don't want, or this is what they want you to believe, or something, like, this is wake up, sheeple. <laughs> I have no idea. Anywho, more important things are afoot. Spider bots blasting down these static defenses. Essentially rocketeers on steroids here. A couple of uh, spy bots accompanying these as well to make sure that these medium tanks stay out of those spider bots hair. Their uh, leg hair. Oh, nice EMP right there. Does mean that a lot of these units will stay paralyzed. They also have a bunch of, recl or sorry, a bunch of Webers right here as well. Lovely, lovely stuff, the Weber. Very great for including in this kind of a composition because it can stop these units from moving and obviously those rocket spiders very, very effective against targets that are not moving. Sheldon trying their very best to deal with all this. Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, gonna paralyze the tanks here just to make sure that we take as efficient a fight with these early spider bots as possible. I don't mind that one bit. These first T2 units can oftentimes have the most effect on the battlefield. So if we're gonna take down a commander and we're gonna take down some static defense, that is all well and good in my book. 
medium tanks also cascading through the defensive lines right here for Barnek. Fiends are really what you're looking for right now in this sort of a situation. Not sure if the Sheldon Ball is going to be sufficient, although that heavy laser tower the Warden is putting in some serious work. Yeah, Rocket Spiders turn their awful gaze towards this green facility up here. That flame turret holding strong, but will not be enough. Oh, 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 okay. EMP does connect with a couple of those Sheldon right there. Yeah, it's all the Sheldon that we have. We desperately need some fiend production at this moment. Yeah, getting those fiends up and running. The Sheldon are a great long-term investment, but what we need right now is short-term heavy firepower. And there's nothing more short-term and heavy firepower than the literal flame spewer himself. The good old-fashioned fiend. 200 metal and 3,000 energy. Relatively cheap as far as T2 is, is concerned, but extremely efficient against that T1. And my goodness, what a porcupine of a defense if I've ever seen one. We've got gauntlets, gauntlets, and more gauntlets accompanied by Sheldon. Ironic that they almost fire the same projectile. The gauntlets is a little bit heavier, but not by a whole lot. Also ironic, we have no resbots eating all this up. I did see somebody just queue one up. I think that was Snife over here queued something up. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, somebody should absolutely start eating up all this wreckage right here, though. Thousands and thousands of metal. In fact, let's take a look at it. Yeah, nearly 3,000 metal. Just uh, hanging out. Doing its thing on the front lines right here. Waiting to be spent. Sharpshooters headed to the front line. Ah. This is a this is a risky way of using your sharpshooters. You send them to the front like this, and oftentimes what ends up happening is your enemy says, Oh, they're going sharpshooters. I'll just build a tick factory. I'll start spamming out ticks, and that counters that pretty effectively. And the problem you run into is, of course, you, uh, you, you give your opponent time to set up that tick factory, as opposed to, uh, for instance, just... Surprising them with 10 sharpshooters that blast away their entire army in one click and then their entire static line in the next And all the reinforcements don't have any chance of ever getting close enough to uh, Effectively shut down the sharpshooters That being said, we are keeping them well behind the T1 line. So at the very least they're semi-efficient in that configuration And we do have the welders mixed in all right, you've won me back over. Just for these welders that were included right here, you've won me back over. Mr. Gradulio has absolutely proven that he is well-versed in the Armada Tactics book. Taking one right out of my book. And I approve. The welders in front of sharpshooters, extremely, extremely efficient. The welders so beefy. And then the sharpshooters, obviously, doing so much damage. Hound's finding themselves in a weird engagement over here. They, oh, okay, yeah. Radar and radar jammer goes down up on this hillside. Those hounds were relying on that provision of where to shoot, but the gauntlets are actually a mediocre counter to those hounds. And yeah, I mean, I guess if you're going to have 45 gauntlets up and running, they'll do pretty decently against hounds. It's all a numbers game. Uh, Weber's and Recluse's moving forward right now. I don't see a way out of this for the blue team. We're going to need some immediate introduction of something serious in order to actually deal with all this. Nice EMPs over there, too. Man, Loudy absolutely on top of it. Spybots have been absolutely critical to this composition success, paralyzing everything over here. Making sure those rocket bots have an extremely easy time firing away a lot of these non-moving targets. Yeah, I like it quite a bit. Might even have to steal this one. Call it the, uh, call it the paralysis composition or something like that. Spider is also very immune to EMP. I mean, uh, a spy bot will get, I'm sure, but Sans a spy bot. Pretty much shurikens, any any light EMP. EMP bombers even have a hard time with them. Basically, any EMP is going to have a really hard time with the uh, the Webbers here. Them, along with amphibious units, have a little bit of a resistance to EMP. It's a, it's one of those one of those rare cases in this game where there's an actual quote unquote armor value, right? Northern side, the point being, looking fabulous right here. Yeah, just mass fabrication in the back line. Not a bad idea whatsoever. The other nice thing about these uh, Webers and Spybots is, of course, they can reclaim. This is something I didn't even know for the longest time. But yeah, uh, Spybots, more than capable of reclaiming, of all things, means that you can use them to pick up the corpses of your enemies. Say, for instance, you need to uh, sneak into a certain area and reclaim everything that they've got. Spybot will do it for you. What on earth was that? We have a was that a scuttle or a bed bug or something? Oh no, we've got a we've got a turret firing from somewhere. <laughs> there it is. Going completely blind. Yeah, it was just dump firing into the same spot over and over here, but we accidentally parked our units right on top of it for two shots. And uh, down they go. Gotta be so careful about that. 
With this kind of an advantage, it would be impressive if somehow Laudi managed to throw away the lead here. We have so many rocket bots coming up right now, but I think now is really the time to go for some eco. I could definitely see this being an excellent opportunity. My goodness, we actually have a lot of wind turbines back here, but I could definitely see this being a good opportunity to pump out an APHIS. You can see 4,000 metal in the bank. Oh, sorry, no, that was a different commander. We have 800 metal in the bank. Certainly, if we stop unit production, though, and we just reclaim off this front line, you're going to have a tremendous amount of forces on the front lines. Oh, that's a bit cheeky. Okay, well, somehow the Webbers have caught a plane. That's definitely the screenshot. <laughs> I haven't seen Webbers snatch a plane out of the sky before, but there you go. Anything can happen and beyond all reason. Some reason they feel like those orange fighters really took that fight inefficiently. Not even entirely sure why. Just felt like they chose the wrong uh, the wrong targets. Every single one of them right there. There's a tremor fi tremor firing away. For some reason this tremor seems to be fairly effective while moving. That's odd. Typically the tremor is hilariously ineffective when moving. I wonder if they adjusted this thing. I called for an adjustment that was, uh, I say that as if I was the authority on this. I called for an adjustment that essentially allowed it to fire whenever any unit was inside its box. It would just let loose a firing. Uh, or, yeah, it would, it would just shoot a projectile up into the air. The way it used to work is it had to acquire a target and then it wouldn't fire until it was absolutely centered on that target. Uh, and what actually ended up happening was you would have this weird situation where it was just kind of bouncing back and forth between targets but never actually connecting with any of them. Seems to me like this is actually going quite a bit better. Maybe it was just a targeting reference reframe. They just made it so that it could retarget a whole lot quicker. That's certainly possible. Ah, oh, there are some bed bugs coming out. That's funny. Okay, well, it's actually a really nice unit for this exact composition. A surprising counterpoint to the uh, the push of the spy bots and the recluses, because of course the recluses need everything to be paralyzed in order to be effective here. It means that if those bed bugs aren't paralyzed, yeah, they actually have a great opportunity to run directly into these spiders right here. They need to be microed a little better. It looks like they're kind of being neglected. I think if you self-destruct one or two of these on these spiders, oh yeah, they're gonna do some serious damage. Well, not that it's gonna matter now that the Big Daddy Razorback has arrived, ready to shut down these pesky spiders. Not bad. Meanwhile, the base for the Purple Commander has collapsed. The Sheldon Bowl has grown to a tremendous size, and these Sheldon are not looking to slow down anytime soon. Razorbacks are being handed out from the back line, though. Razorbacks will be more than enough to clean all this up, but those Webbers are making this so efficient. Yeah, you can see those Webbers reclaiming all the units that die on the front lines here. Hilariously, hilariously efficient unit because of that. Here come the Sheldon, marching their way through. This is the we this is the reason Sheldon are so strange. They're, they fill so many different roles. They're an assault bot because they can move forward and do damage to enemy bases pretty quickly. They're a siege bot because obviously they have such a long range. Uh, and they're, they they have a lot of kiting potential. Like they're fairly mobile. They fill a really they fill a really weird multitude of roles that not a whole lot of other bots really say that they can. Shutting down a lot of the production right here for the green commander as well as the purple commander. That's always nice. Southern side, however, despite the the northern side looking fabulous, those Razorbacks are going to put in some serious work. Southern side here now in a whole lot of trouble. Yeah, welders marching forward. Do we have any more of those sharpshooters left? Looks like most of them have gone down. That's okay, though. Looks like they broke this line, shot down the commanders over here, completely ravaged the T1 defenses, unsurprisingly. And now it's going to be the red team on defense. T2 fighters are pulled, and those will shoot down those gunships lickety-split. Down they go, falling out of the sky. And those are expensive, too. Those are 370 metal apiece, lots of energy as well. Definitely expensive to lose a whole bunch of those. I mean, it's not the most expensive thing in the book. Certainly, it could be dragons. That would be even worse. But, yeah, losing those, uh, those wasps takes a lot of your capabilities out of your hands, too, as well indicates that, yeah, you don't actually have a tremendous air wall now, which is probably what the blue player is thinking. Hey, wait a second. There's absolutely no anti-air defenses. There's a couple going up right now. A flag turret about to be built. But until then, there was basically no anti-air defenses as far as uh, air units go anyways. Razorbacks having a field day. Finally, a spy bot will catch it and allow these rocket spiders to fire away at it. Weber's included here to keep it paralyzed. Spy bots versus spy bots. Spy versus spy. Anybody remember those cartoons? The comics and the cartoons? Those were great. Some good old antics. Some spy versus spy antics. More welders marching in. That's what I like about the welders. They're fairly disposable. They're they're cheap enough that they can be disposable, but they're so so beefy that they can march in. They really are the medium tank of the T2 era. It's a very 
weird comparison, but I think you understand the the meaning there. They have they have the the rigidity of a medium tank uh, with the mobility to get into actual enemy backlines and then put out enough damage to actually be worth anything. It's a weird kind of roll, but it is a very crucial one. Sharpshooters kind of nonchalantly thrown to the fronts. That's definitely not ideal. More and more gunships continuing to get shot out of the skies over here. My goodness. We just need tons and tons of fighter production, if anything. Luckily, the, luckily the, the only redeeming quality here, I should, you know, luckily with a grain of salt, but uh, the, this is a mixed composition. We have T1 and T2 fighters, so at the end of the day, that flak turret will take out a majority of it. Not all of it, but a majority of it. No T3 production, though, for the red team. Absolutely killing them. These T3 units are so efficient on the fronts here. Really, really difficult to keep up with a T3 army if you don't have one yourself. And that's why these Razorbacks are able to hold this line essentially single-handedly. Big breakthrough of uh, heavy tanks over here, though. Bunch of Tigers moving forward. Mr. Hale 28 trying to move forward to go for the D-Gun. I think the Razorback will be more than sufficient. Definitely want to keep that commander around, though, because you never know when you might need to go for a D-Gun. There we go. There, there, oh, there we go. D-Gun will connect with a whole bunch of those me or those uh, heavy tanks, pardon me. Shutting down a whole lot of them. I think that will be deflected quite nicely. Yeah. So far, the Air Forces have been spectacular at shooting down these gunships when they overstep right here. Wouldn't mind seeing them pulled again right now, but the blue, blue player obviously a little concerned about making sure those heavy tanks don't make it into the enemy backline. Or into the friendly backline, pardon me. Another green Razorback marching across right here. Oh, it finds the T2 lab. Yeah, that could be huge. Pops some of the build power, keeping the lab alive. Very, very nicely done. Ah, uh, those gunships, though, more than enough to blast down that Razorback in time. It's exactly why those gunships are so useful. They're a very neat, a very easy solution to a T3 problem. And I think the era of the spy bot, or sorry, the era of the spider bot really is over. I appreciate it, trust me. The, spy, the spider bots is probably some of my favorite in the entire game. Just as far as like stylistically goes, but also how thematic, right? This this unit paralyzes its food before devouring it live. What a what a perfect representation of a spider, right? But unfortunately not very efficient, especially against those T3 units. Even some of the T2 units, they start to fall off pretty quick. Now I wouldn't mind if maybe we just saw mass Weber production. We just saw a little bit of eco shenanigans and then mass Weber production. Webers are relatively cheap and the uh, eco behind it can be quite expensive, so going for a little mixture like that can be definitely powerful because obviously those Webers have the ability to reclaim. It means that you can actually fund really aggressive economic expansion. It's almost a cheese, is almost what I want to call it, just because it's so, so aggressively economical. But certainly be, can be quite effective. Scimitar just barely escaping. By the skin on his teeth, manages to waddle the commander away. Still not out of trouble yet, though. Those Sheldon are firing away from a long distance. If this isn't enough to single-handedly convince you to build a couple of pinpointers, I don't know what is. Eventually, the commander does fall right here, though, for Scimitar. Also conveniently clearing out a whole bunch of those walls over here and leaving a nice, juicy, sideways corpse. What on earth is that commander doing? Look at him. Look at him standing up sideways. He's sleeping sideways. Where did that Zar go? I swear we saw one. Um... Hmm. There it is. Very injured at this point. Certainly quite powerful, though. I think the wasps could actually deal with all this, yeah. You know what? I think if, I think the wasps pulled forward right now. They might be able to do enough damage before the fighters pull that they could actually deal with all this. Obviously very risky, because if you lose all your wasps, then you don't actually have enough to defend, say there were any major breakthroughs, right? I like that we have the butlers coming up right here, as well as the res bots. Definitely intending to reclaim as much of this as possible, or at least that's what we should be going for. Wouldn't be surprised. With silver chevrons, I believe you get that from, uh, I want to say the full silver is 5,000 hours of gameplay. Max Muster definitely got to be well aware of what exactly we should be using those red spots for. Here comes another Razorback. This is exactly what those wasps are sitting around waiting for. This is exactly their opportunity to shine, and there we go. Another breakthrough Razorback is shot down here. Fighter pull. Well, a curse. Fighter pull is pulled. Oh, there's some anti-air, though. Yeah, we have those anti-air bots mixed in here. We have a little bit of static anti-air as well. 
This is how you relieve some of the pressure from your air player to allow them to go into these fighter heavy compositions, uh, or pardon me, into these gunship heavy compositions. You just have to build a bunch of static AA. Otherwise, this sort of thing happens, and there's no other way for the Orange Commando to keep all these units safe and loses them every single time to the enemy fighters. However, that being said, this fighter will is severely depleted because of that little engagement right here, so it opens up an opportunity for a bunch of Stormbringers. Are we going to try and bombard the enemy right here? No, we are not, actually. Okay. What is the play of trying to select all of these here? Very, very difficult. The Stormbringers move very quick. <laughs> there we go. Whole bunch of them, and it looks like we're just headed directly into the back lines over here. Okay, we're going to go for the fusion reactors. Not bad. No scout for these, so remember, we're kind of just targeting off of a whim. Ooh, and not managing to get very much at all. Yeah, those T2 fighters, man, they're impressive. Shooting down all those bombers extremely, extremely efficiently. Down goes that entire T1 air push right there from the Red Commander. We're losing the efficiency. The Red Team was such a tremendous advantage, but those T3 units were too efficient, and they managed to push them all the way back to the defensive midline. Thor right here being a huge pain as well. Ironically, a pretty good unit with the uh, spider bots. I'm, I'm so continually impressed with how efficient these spider bots have been this game. Just because of how slow it is, but it's being kited expertly. Extremely well. Professionally, you might even say. Tolero here, moving this Thor back and forth. Kiting left and right here. Obviously not going to be perfect because it's a Thor, and it doesn't move all too quick. But while it is moving, you can see the majority of those rockets do actually miss, which is the most important thing. Weber's continuing to move forward. It's the other thing about the Thor. It is re resistant to these EMPs, right? So it doesn't really matter if the... Uh, it doesn't really matter if those Webers get on top of it. It is high time that we switch away from these spiders. Yeah. Don't like the spiders anymore. They were excellent in the early game. Not going to be too impactful at this point. Calm stuck. Yeah, I think it was... There we go. <laughs> stuck on the outside of the map somehow. But it will eventually be picked up and transported away. Demon has been produced and sent to the front line here for Max Mustard. I uh, don't know where it came from. It must have come from the back line somewhere. Yeah, must have, must have been a T3 gantry here at one point, but then eaten up to go into a little bit more eco. Nuclear launcher has been charged over here. Getting ready to fire. They're going to target directly, or at least the blue player thinks they should target directly into the uh, orange base over there, but there is an anti-nuke. Unlike me, the orange player has remembered to build their anti-nuke. Very, very nice to see indeed. are efficient. Yeah. Those demons are really, really good at their job. Up goes the nuke. Out goes the anti-nuke, intercepting that thermobaric ballistic missile and detonating it high up in the sky where none shall be affected. Beautifully done. Looks like that was built just about in time. There's no more charges on the anti-nuke. You can't even see where it is. It's somewhere in this mess. Uh, there it is. OP. Yeah. Halfway charged at another missile too, so nicely done at the very least that we uh, managed to get this, managed to get that anti-nuke up and basically exactly on time in order to counter all that. Mammoth's trying to break through right here. I actually like that quite a lot. The Mammoth's obviously very sturdy. The uh, middle of the map has seen very little action for a good long while. <laughs> Poopy Tartoni has been well well engaged at trying to build up an economy right here. You can see the T1 energy converters churning out a whopping 11 metal per second here. We're overflowing quite a bit, though. We'd love to see a little bit more built and sent through the middle of the map. There we go. There's a Thor. More than happy to just blast away at this uncloaked commander right there, taking down the T2 lab. Sometimes it really is easy as... It really is as easy as sending... My goodness, what a sentence. It really is as easy as sending a single unit or two in the right caliber to the right location. And end up with this sort of a this sort of a push. Thor obviously extremely prone to D gun here. With that commander out of the way, at the very least, the Thor is gonna be having a blast. Marching right on towards this at the very least T1 production facility. Hasn't quite found the T2. Maybe won't find the T2. Gunship's trying their very best to prevent it. There we go. Alright, Thor does eventually go down. It's about time. That Thor had been causing all kinds of trouble. There's another one over here as well. EMP missile. Collides with a whole bunch of this stuff. 
Did the demon not take any EMP there? That's a bit strange. Can't tell if it was out of range or if it just didn't get affected by the EMP missile. Either way, Thor does a huge amount of damage in a big old burst. So you do have to be really careful about using it around a, uh, or sorry, using those those software units like the demons or the Razorbacks or the Marauders. Weird to think of those T3 units as the softer units, but it really is. Resbot's patching up this Thor over here. Lovely stuff. That's what we're looking for. That's the kind of play that you can use to sustain a complex late game push like this. EMP missiles headed out as well. Beautiful EMP connections. They don't have the widest area on them, but certainly quite capable. Shutting down specific infrastructure and managing to allow you to break through. Typically excellent targets makes, make for uh, static defenses or any sort of uh, heavy, heavy impact unit, like a sharpshooter or a starlight. Or uh, mammoths are a pretty good target as well. Anything that would otherwise impair the progress right here of the Thor. Moving on in. Styles the Rosa's commander is in position right here. Could absolutely go for the D-gun of all D-guns, trying to break down those Thors. But they've already gone too far. They're going to continue waddling their way forward on all one, two, three, four of their tracks. Is that actually six? Or it might be six. No, it looks like it's four. I wondered if maybe it was like uh, a forward track, two forward tracks, and then two rear tracks, and then two side tracks. But no, it looks like it's just four. Two big ones and two small ones. Fair enough. The Maroon Commander does go down. Fighter pull. Sends a whole bunch of these fighters careening into each other. My goodness. The air pull is immense. The dedicated... Oh, that's a nice nuke right there. The dedicated blue air player taking on two half-dedicated air players here for the red team. Not the end of the world. You can definitely make that, make that possible, make it happen. Behemoth marching to the front, by the way. And these anti-air trucks actually doing a great job. The problem you have, though, is coordination. Right, so you never know if, uh, for instance, you're going to have one, one half of the air forces in one side of the map and the other half on the other side of the map. But obviously, any fighter pull is going to be half as strong as your opponents. Here are these flak trucks, though, moving into position. This is actually absolutely critical. Yeah, flak trucks going to catch all these bombers right here. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful positioning right there on those flak trucks. That is absolutely spectacular. We're splitting up the bombers here to try and mitigate some of that impact right there, but more than half of those bombers did go down. That being said, four of them still made it through. Does not take much in order for those bombers to be effective. Luckily, some fighters will be pulled here from the Orange Commander and shoot, shut down those, shoot and shut down those bombers. Very, very nicely done. That definitely could have been a tragedy right there, but those flak trucks absolutely saving the day from Snipe. Very, very nicely done. Demon versus Thor. It's a brutal matchup. D-Gun, however, will make that nice and easy right here. Max Mustard moving back up to the high ground with the commander. Trying to keep it nice and cloaked and out of trouble. We have the Razorback over here as well being killed by LLTs. Bit of a rare one. Oh, Mustard didn't realize. Oh, no. Oh, Mustard didn't realize the Razorback was so close and it immediately kills the commander. Does not take long for those T3 units to melt down those commanders. It's one of the things that makes him so dangerous, especially in the late game. Killing those commanders. Obviously, the goal of Beyond All Reason is killing all of your opponent's commanders. You can see the blue team, uh, sorry, the red team, at two commanders right now, whereas the blue is sitting on a much more reasonable five. I would be so scared with this behemoth sitting so far forward without any sort of T1 unit support. The lack of units supporting this behemoth right now really scares me because, of course, a D gun could ravage all 20,000 metal of that behemoth. It is, however, a convincing defense in the middle of the map right here. Hardly anything is going to be able to break through this middle line reasonably efficiently, guys. There we go. Demon on the top has been completely blasted apart here. Arbiters and Sheldon Bull. One of those age-old Cortex compositions. It's one of the things that I like about Cortex compositions. They're relatively simple, but can be dangerously effective. This is going to be beautiful. Oh, there we go. Thor rolling over a big line of heavy mines right there. All you really need is a bunch of Sheldon and a bunch of Arbiter, and you pretty much got yourself a really rock-solid composition. Throw in a couple of Grunts and maybe a Radar on a Radar Jammer bot. You have yourself a field day. Hey, you know what? Those Demons, when they can get a nice surround, obviously doubling the damage is going to make them quite a bit more powerful here. You can definitely shut down those T3 with extremely concerning ease.
I think this behemoth could turn the tide in this, though. I think if we chose to support this behemoth a little better, sending a big tick spam forward to accompany this behemoth, sending a grunt spam, sending any kind of spam, really, I think it might actually make this behemoth the turning point of this game. Obviously real tricky. You have to make sure that you keep that thing well clear of commanders that want to dig in it. Easier said than done. In virtually every sense. Static defense is coming up, though. We do have a Starlight, or sorry, a Pulsar that was built up here. The Static Starlight. A little fighter way of colliding with each other as well. Up on the northern side. Very nice and done. I think at the end of the day... Yeah, it's going to be the orange commander who actually takes to the skies and manages to win that air fight. Demons and gunships also shooting down a titan that was marching its way over here, actually. That's a really nice catch. 8,000 metal lying on the ground. Obviously going to be quite nice for cleaning up. A, res a resurrection squad wouldn't be the end of the world either, though. Full-blown T3 production coming out here from Snipe, trying to get some of these, high these heavy-hitting, high-power T3 units out onto the field. Wouldn't mind seeing a whole bunch of Karganeth as well, just because they have such ease traversing all this terrain. With gunships doing so much damage. Heavy mines also really effective. Yeah, it was about 20% immediately wiped off that Thor's health bar right there. Heavy mines obviously going to be quite good against heavy units. And we go for a uh, self-destructor. I like the idea, but just a little too slow with the the pull right there, or the command right there. Not surprising. The command was very difficult to time properly, especially on those T3 units where it's nearly 10 seconds for the self-destruct on some of them. Sometimes you have to start self-destructing before the unit has even encountered any danger. It's the difference 10 seconds can make. I'm sure all the fellas can agree. Thor being chilling right in front of all these starlights cannot be a comfortable place for it. Nobody has ever felt com comfortable under direct pulsar scrutiny. Essentially built to take out units like the Thor. Single big heavy targets. Exactly what the Pulsar is built for dealing with here. So, in many senses, a great static defense being set up right here by the Yellow Commander. Pulsar is also relatively cheap in the grand scheme of things. 3,500 metal. Only takes a couple of really big kills in order to make that really efficient. We are going to go for the reds right here. Cheeky, cheeky. Whoa, Vanguard has something else to say about it, though. Yeah, Vanguard trying to convince those resbots not to do that. I don't think it's going to matter, though. The grunts moving forward are granting the vision for this vanguard to fire away. Beautiful connections right there. Oh, that hurts so badly. The, sh the, the explosion and the aftershock taking out each and every one of those resbots. Beautifully done. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to resurrect that with that much grunt coverage right there. Indeed, a bunch of the resbots coming out right here from Poopy Tartoni. We had some other ones there as well. Yeah, 1984. Also getting involved in eating up a whole bunch of that big tank, as well as anything else we can find. The Juggernaut Demon Behemoth push. That instills fear in even the most stalwart of beyond all reason players. Certainly the direct counter to any heavy T3 unit is the behemoth and its D-gun-like blast. Extremely capable of mass devastation. This little uh, LLT is quite good against chaff too. Make it a formidable force for pushing into bases like this. Still though. Absurdly prone to de-gunning. Yeah, to, to de Love that we have these anti-air trucks still, though. Keeping the anti-air tra air truck production around is actually really nicely, uh, or really nicely done. Let's spread those out quite a bit and actually just use them to uh, be, you know, kind of forward-moving anti-air defenses can be really, really powerful. You can imagine if that sort of thing had been accompanying pushes on the southern side here, encompassing any of those pushes with any sort of uh, anti-air capabilities would have shut down shurikens, anything like that. EMPs do connect with the demons, by the way. That earlier EMP made me wonder if maybe the demon had its uh, EMP status removed, but I think it was just barely outside of range of the EMP missile. This is a great use of the Thors, though. Yeah, textbook case for using the Thor. EMP these pulsars so that they're not blasting away at your super heavy tanks, and then marching them forward here to deal with those static defenses. Now, luckily for the Yellow Commander, these gunships are on top of it. They're going to start blasting away at all this, causing quite a lot of trouble. Not bad. The Scarecrow going for it. I think we took down one of the behemoths already. Oh, oh, so close. Ah! Commander is revealed. 
Deacon's down some of the demons, but it will be killed right there by the Behemoth. Behemoth, obviously the primary target right there, so not taking it down is a little bit worrisome. New connects with that big bull hole with T2 units in the middle of the map here as well. Always good to see. I don't know if throwing Thors at the Behemoths is going to work. Ooh, let's see, what was that? 25%? 23%? Something like that? Wiped off that... Gosh, it might have been even more. Obviously, a unit is more susceptible to that Behemoth's weapon the bigger the unit is. Because, of course, that, that weapon relies on the amount of surface area that you collide with. Is that thing is killer against Thors. Those extra thick tanks. Need D-Gun, cries out the blue commander Scarecrow, and I couldn't agree more. Do we have it, though? Uh, we're about neck and neck as far as commander count goes. We have four commanders remaining right here for the blue team. Mr. Hale, one of them, sitting around over here on this right-hand side. Wouldn't mind seeing that being moved up to the front line, either vis-a-via -vis a transport or via a transport, pardon me. Or just by uh, walking on over there. You have plenty of time. It's not like the behemoth moves all too fast. <laughs> Whoa, where did this come from, though? Oh, no. Thor in the back line, causing some trouble. Must have just rolled its way around, up, down, and around the hills. Oh, no. Finds its way directly into the build power of the, the uh, hot pink commander. One or two shots well targeted should be enough damage. Okay, well, despite a miracle run by from this uh, Thor over here, virtually no damage was taken. <laughs> this goes to show having the right units does not necessarily equate to having an effective army. Controlling it is at least 50% of the battle. That was about 20%. Knocked off that uh, Titan right there. Maybe a little less. Maybe closer to 16, 8, 17, 18%. Absolutely rips through these high quality T3 units. Speaking of Thors in the back line, though. Nuclear bombers. Tasked with turning that Thor into a pile of molten slag. Molten thermonuclear slag. Juggernaut on the southern side. Going to start blasting away here as well. Absurdly tanky beast of a unit. Not altogether the most powerful, though. I feel like if you were to power scale all the units, the behemoth has got to be on top, right? I think there's no other unit that can really crown the behemoth as far as sheer damage potential. I have seen some nasty behemoth trades in my day. Things like behemoths firing into big balled up groups of Thors, knocking 20-30% off each Thor, and hitting four or five Thors in a single run. I do wonder what the record would be. Maybe the record would be a behemoth firing into a group of other behemoths. Scimitar will degun down the Juggernaut over here on this side. Wonder if that might have been necessary. Honestly, I think that Juggernaut was already pretty close to death right there. I can't help but wonder. Oh, interesting. It, uh, its debris wasn't wiped out here. That seems like a little bit of a bug. Anywho, can't help but wonder if maybe that was a little bit of a mistake, actually. It looks like that Juggernaut was pretty close to dying on its own anyways there. Maybe leaving it alive and just letting it die of, you know, natural nat natural causes, quote-unquote, would have been the right idea so that we could go for the res. In fact, I think whoever reses more here on the southern side is going to end up winning it. Yeah, you can see so many Thors, so many Shiva, so much of all this T3 has just been left sitting around down here. If we resurrect any amount of this and send it forward, it's going to be a great day for the red team. It's exactly what's happening up on this northern side. Demons and Thors and all the good stuff being resurrected over here. Slowly marching forward. Love that these now have a... Uh, what is it called? They now have a backpacking anti-air missile. Means that they can shoot down the fighters when they're just parked underneath the air wall like this. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it really is chipping away at this air wall quite nicely. Thinning the numbers, so to speak. Mitigating the fighter count for... Well, the Seafoam Green player, at the very least. Not so much taking down all too many of the uh, fighters of the Blue Commander, but any little bit helps. Obviously, moving the AA trucks forward and getting those under the air wall would be really something else. Nuke up in the air once more. That doesn't look like there's an anti-nuke to shut it down. 
boom goes the nuke, but I don't think it complied at all too much. A couple of, uh, my goodness, more than a couple of bulwarks over here. Three bulwarks, two titans, a Razorback, and a Thor. All walk into a bar. So this is the start of a great joke. We have these, uh, random T3 units that Mr. Poopy Tartoni has been building here. Not using very much, but building. And there's the dragon army. Pretty much any time you're up against a Cortex Commander, you can almost always count on them to build about 400 dragons. It seems to be impossible for Cortex Commanders to ignore that dragon button and going for something in the air. Fair enough, I suppose. Who wouldn't want a 40-ton brick that shoots fire and lasers and anti-air missiles off of its rear? Pretty compelling argument, if I do say so myself, even if it comes at a price tag of 5,000 metal apiece. Titans and Thors marching forward here. It really does feel like the ideal armada composition in the end. Titans so multifaceted. They have their little hand cannon impulse blasters. Perfect for dealing with chaff. High enough damage they can deal with T1 and T2 stuff relatively efficiently. Not so high damage though that it's very effective against T3. And to make up for that, of course, they have their little tachyon beam backpack. Very, very good at dealing with any of those high health units, any of those high high HP T3 units. And then, of course, the rockets, because who doesn't like firing a couple of rockets at your enemies? When in doubt, shoot a rocket out. That's what I always say. Dem Demons burning forward here. Doing a damn good job of it, actually. Scimitar's commander will be obliterated in the hellfires that follow the demons everywhere they go. Titan now marching forward on the southern side. These demons need only march forward right now, and I think they're going to be able to absolutely devastate this southern part of the world. Yeah. Titan putting in a good fight right here. But the demons are just too quick. Uh, you know, that being said, that backpack tachyon beam. Very, very good. I underestimated just how effective it would be against these demons. Here come the gunships, though. Massive gunship pull. My goodness, the fighters are right on top of it. Oh, no. <laughs> Eventually, they do manage to take out the geothermal. I don't know if that was worth it. Three or four bombers could have effectively done the same thing. Certainly would have been quite a bit more cost-effective to go for four bombers and ten fighters, but either way, I guess at the end of the day, we did shut down that T3 production facility right here for Gradulio, the Green Commander, meaning that at the very least, for the time being, the southern side T3 production will be relieved. That being said, I suppose the influx of forces on the southern side for as far as uh, the red team goes means that now the blue team are going to send a whole lot more attention down there so we can see the seafoam t3 units heading in that direction luckily these resbots have patched together quite a nice army to hold the lines right here a couple of shiva a couple of razorbacks there's a demon and a thor all looking pretty good those dragons up in the sky burning away at one of these juggernauts that's coming through down it goes all those de all those uh i want to call them demons all the dragons will fly on back for repairs over here one of those rare weird cases where the air repair pad becomes useful when you're playing with dragons pretty much the only time i think i mean i can't really imagine maybe something like a uh something like a nuclear bomber strategy might be effective too those have a fair amount of health there's those uh legion units as well which have a decent amount of hp that was complicated Juggernaut exploded, killed the commander. Before the commander died, it fired a D-gun. The uh, Titan killed the Juggernaut. Juggernaut killed the commander. Commander killed the Titan over here. It was like rock, paper, scissors. Kind of beautiful, actually. Beyond all reason, rock, paper, scissors. Here come the resbots, though, trying to patch up anything they can find. Lovely stuff. Push on the northern side, looking unstoppable. Push on the southern side, looking unstoppable. Who will pull the trigger first? Titans need only avoid the commanders to make sure that they don't get degunned. I'm pretty sure we're aware of this commander over here. Our hesitancy to move any further south indicates to me at the very least that we're aware that Max Mustard's commander must be alive over here somewhere. Calm here, cries out Mr. Hales. Or Mr. Hale 28, pardon me. <laughs> Max Mustard hiding over there. 
knows it's only a matter of time before that commander is discovered. Boom, and down goes the yellow commander right there. Dragons in the sky, meanwhile, to shut down this T3. And man, you know what? Every T3 push I consider unstoppable. I always forget that those dragons exist to shut them down. Doing an absolutely gargantuan amount of work here. Cut, cutting these titans down, burning them down, and blasting them down. And stopping them from getting into the heart of this base over here. More air bear pads over here to keep these dragons healthy. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Nothing short of a full-blown T2 air pole will manage to actually kill those. They're so, so tanky. It's one of those few... It's one of those few units in this game that doesn't have a multitude of ways to address it. That's what the, that's what the dragon is. It's a, it's a problem that only has one solution, and it's mass T2 air. There's, uh, there's basically, basically no other way to really efficiently deal with a mass dragon player, other than a mass fighter player. I've been frustrated about that in the past, but maybe that was just me misunderstanding the matchup. Certainly fair enough. User error accounts for like 99% of errors or something like that. Doesn't make it feel any better, though, when ten of them roll into your base, and you just have to watch the world burn. <laughs> Laudy has actually got a commander that was resurrected, I believe. Yeah, resurrected commander up here on the front line. Not bad, actually. Oh, yeah, we're having a little issue. There we go. Managed to degun that Titan. That's quite nice, actually. Cheeky little commander on the front, degunning down T3 units. Feels a little bit uh, risky, obviously, but I guess you can always just pick that commander back up using this mass resbot on me. Not bad. This is the reason why I hotkey or auto hotkey my resbots, by the way, so that I can control all of them so I don't just have some slackers hanging out not doing anything. And watch them all get wiped out in a single instance from a friendly juggernaut explosion. Very cool. doing mass bulwark defense over here. This is one of those situations where we're firing into our enemy's army, and we're aiming for the enemy's army, and we're not aiming for the enemy's economy. The red team seems more than content to just continue firing away at each other's front lines forces here. Realistically, though, it's not who you're aiming for. You're aiming for these back lines. You're aiming for the economies in the back. Always important to keep perspective of that. You risk trading your army for effectively no value otherwise. What I'm really surprised about is the lack of aggression through the middle of the map. It really feels like we haven't seen the purple commander or the brown commander either send units forward to try and aggress the middle of the map here. It is very tricky, obviously, when you send units forward in the middles of the map. Anybody from any side can collapse down on top of your army. Makes it very tricky. Overall economies, though. What a stupendous advantage for the blue team. I don't see how, given the economic numbers, if this holds, the blue team doesn't end up taking the victory here. At some point, it does just become a numbers game. Dragon's gonna fall back. We have these set to retreat at 80%, so they will they will fall back pretty quickly. Not a bad idea, because it does mean most of your dragons are gonna survive. Yeah, there you go. All of the dragons will survive, actually. I hear a little little blinks. A little like uh, like somebody tapping on metal outside their their hole. Is someone trying to get in? It sounds like somebody's knocking on the door. And it's all of Hell's Fury, anti-air missiles, anti-air projectiles, Gatling guns, cannons, everything in everybody's toolbox firing at them. And they're trying to figure out if it's the uh, Uber Eats guy delivering the, the food outside. Can't figure it out. There we go. Finally a pull. My goodness, the rocket spiders too. <laughs> the uh, fat boys here are actually contributing a lot of anti-ground, yeah. An absurd amount of AoE. 
What a funky engagement right there. Overall, an excellent trade right there, I think, for the purple commander. Managed not to lose the doors. Managed to keep a lot of those fat boys up and running as well here. Purple commander lost a couple of those Razorbacks, which are quite expensive. But I think we just need to go. The other thing we need is some of these anti-air trucks sent down through the middle of the map. Just to make sure that no matter what, we constantly keep shooting down planes whenever we can. I'm gonna go ahead and speed this game up. Yeah, looks like neither team really interested in fighting. Both teams trying to build up a substantial force to crush through the other one. But neither one actually wanting to pull the trigger here. Razorbacks and Titans dying in the middle of the map right here. Excellent EMBs from that Thor. Do manage to shut it down. Fighters pulled near the middle of the map. I wonder if we're going to go for an air scout. We do have a whole bunch of those scout planes. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to send those across. Always good to try and go for an air scout whenever you can. Nicely done by the Orange Commander, though, to shoot those fighters out of the sky over here. Titans and Behemoths going head to head. Well, Titans and Juggernauts actually going head to head with Behemoths. Staying out of range of that Behemoth Cannon, though, very important. You can see the uh, Titans and Juggernauts dancing around over here because they do not want to stay within range of that. Mass Titans moving through the middle of the map. Taking two steps forward and one step back. Slowly but surely. They're keeping an eye out for those dragons, though. I'll tell you right now, that's exactly what we're keeping our eyes open for, and there they are. <laughs> half the army pulls back, half the army pushes forward. No way you're going to break through with that sort of commitment. And just like that, those dragons are going to have another feast. Every time those dragons kill something, it just feels like we're going to see four more added onto the pile using the metal of whatever they burn down. Such a frustrating unit to go up against because unless your unless your air guy doesn't pull uh, or unless your air guy pulls all of the T2 fighters to try and kill the dragons, there's just no way you're gonna kill them. It requires a little bit of teamwork. Not the most teamwork, but at least a little bit. Might be an opportunity though. With all the dragons down south, it means the fighters in orange do have to protect them. Could mean that the blue commander could go for something up on the northern side. Looks like we are going to go for something, by the way. We do have a Calamity Cannon coming up and running. The LOL Cannon. Get ready to start firing. Well, I say get ready. Only about halfway built right now. A little less than that. One of those, uh, one of those projects that you start up with the intent of ending a game. So the question is, how many bases can this hit? Looks to me like the answer is going to be about three or so. Yeah, I would say probably the majority of the red base is going to go most of the pink base as well and all of the brown parts of the front line here yeah yeah enough of the enough of the front line would certainly go away though definitely make it worth it behemoth blasting away at a bunch of these thors this is the epic late game welcome aboard man the behemoth what an absolute t3 melter lovely lovely stuff Hey, dragons are caught right there as well. Beautiful stuff right there from the blue commander. Uses those fighters to shut down a bunch of those dragons, taking them out of the skies and shutting down a severe amount of the snowball effect that the orange commander was relying on using those dragons and their effective T3 or anti-T3 flamethrowers. We're so close to finish here. We need to start funneling metal as, oh, as much over here as possible. I do see Jeanette holding on to a whole bunch of metal. A cool 5,000 in the bank could certainly go a long way towards helping build the calamity. Looking for donations. Mass Thor pull right here, though. What is that? Four or five Thors marching forward right now. 100 Archangels falling behind as well. Making sure that if any dragons show their face, they're more than prepared to blast them out of the skies immediately. EMP rockets. EMP rockets, please. Calamity starts firing. Calamity is up and running, and it's going to start firing away right here. Red team is immediately put on the clock. It's now or never. I'm curious how these Archangels are going to do against the Dragons. I really want to see it. I think the answer is poorly. <laughs> Despite there being how many in total? 50 Archangels in total. Barely scratching those Dragons still. But luckily, the Calamity is firing away in the back line. Starting to ravage these T3 bases over here. Poopy Tartoni starting to lose the T3 facility. And we're going to target down the Aphises, target down the Fusions, target down everything explosive that we can first, and open up some of those nuclear or anti-nuclear shields here. 
Titans marching forward. Dragon significantly hindered by that anti-air ball. Well, that being said, it's way back there. Not really in so much of a position to help anymore. Calamity might just be enough to turn the tides, though. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. We're starting to just fire away as far as we can. I don't know if we don't know about this facility right here for the Red Commander. It could be. Let's take a look at the player view. No, we totally know about that facility. Looks like it won't matter, though. Because just like that, the red team yields to the unrelenting economic force of the blue team. Beautifully, beautifully done. Continuing to eco-scale and eventually getting more and more of that T3 out on the field with a massive push through the middle of the map and eventually a lull cannon to close things out. Beautifully done right here by the blue team in this epic, extreme late game scenario. Thanks a ton for watching. If you made it all the way to the end, I would definitely appreciate it. If you would like this video, it helps get them out there. And that's always cool, cool beans. And I will see you in the very next Beyond All Reason cast. Peace out, everybody.